A man armed with two pistols this morning went on a shooting spree in two Arkansas towns, killing seven people and wounding four others. Police say the suspect, Gene Simmons, had just... Tonight we are learning more about an alleged murder for hire plot in Hot Springs. His mother tells me she can't believe what has happened in her small community. Brand new video just in from inside an Arkansas nightclub where a shooter opened fire. I have a location in rural Crawford County to where the possible location of Cassie may be located. In Bentonville, Arkansas, the hometown of Walmart, a trial is about to begin over the mysterious death of... I'm your host, Nikki T, and you're listening to Strictly Homicide, an Arkansas true crime podcast that discusses lesser-known cases out of the natural state. Thanks for listening to another episode of Strictly Homicide Podcast. I want to say thank you to all our patrons and everyone who rated and reviewed the show. If you enjoy the show, don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or any other major podcast app. Make sure to stay tuned at the end of the episode to hear a few promos from some of my favorite podcasts. Warning. Strictly Homicide covers cases that involve sexual assault, violence, and homicide. Episodes may contain explicit language and are not suitable for young ears. Listener discretion is advised. I'd like to start episode 12 by thanking our newest patrons, Kara J and Greg S. Thank you so much for your support. Arkansas Native left us a five-star review on iTunes, and I want to say thank you for that. Episode 12 takes place in Little Rock, Arkansas, so today's interesting facts will be about Little Rock. The oldest standing state capitol building west of the Mississippi was built in Little Rock between 1833 and 1842. It's no longer used and is now called the Old State House. The actual state capitol that we use now was designed after the White House in Washington, D.C. They've actually used it as a double in a few movies. Up until 2015, every day at 11 a.m., a daily duck march would begin at the Peabody Hotel. A group of ducks would march into the fountain in the hotel lobby, and then at 5 p.m., they would march right back up to their ducky penthouse on the roof. Sadly, in 2015, the Marriott bought the Peabody and the Daily March ended. When the Little Rock Zoo opened originally in 1926, it only had two animals, a circus-trained bear and an abandoned timber wolf. Globetrotter Hubert Geese Osby attended Philander Smith College in Little Rock. Later, his wife wrote the Globetrotters and told them about his unique play and how he averaged 30 points per game. This led to a tryout, which eventually got him on the team. In 1954, segregation in schools was ruled unconstitutional, and a group of black students made history when they were escorted into Little Rock Central High School by the Arkansas National Guard per President Eisenhower's orders. There is now statues of the nine students outside of the state capitol. You may have heard of these nine students, known as the Little Rock Nine. The Arkansas School for the Deaf is located in Little Rock. The school's mascot is the Leopard, and in 2016, the band Deaf Leopard met with the school and posed in a picture with students holding their scoreboard, which read, Deaf Leopards. In 1990, the world's largest soda float was created, including 1,200 pounds of Coleman skim milk and 936 gallons of Coke. Stevie Wonder's song, I Was Made to Love Her, opens with, I was born in Lil Rock, but he wasn't. In 2001, Wyckoff Coffee House and Candy Company was selling 2,000 bottles a day of love potion named Niagara. It was water mixed with what they call love herbs and caffeine. It's said to jumpstart the female libido. Pfizer, the maker of Viagra, threw a fit over the similarity in the name. The U.S. distributor and owner of the coffee house, Larry Williams, said it was created in Sweden in 1993, before Viagra. They finally agreed to change the name to Nexite. Well, now that you know a little more about our capital city, Little Rock, let's get to today's case. 
This episode will discuss domestic abuse. This is a trigger for you. I would skip this episode. Amy grew up in Little Rock with her mom and sister, Nikki. When Amy was born, her mother let Nikki pick out her name. She said that she named her sister Amy after her best friend at the time. Nikki was so excited to have a little sister. Amy was the rebellious one. When you ask Nikki to describe her younger sister, she would say that she's careless, hard-headed, stubborn, and was a free spirit. When Amy was 16, she was working at a grocery store in Little Rock when a man came in and caught her eye. The man's name was William Dunlap, but he went by Billy. Billy was 14 years older than Amy. Amy lied to her mom about Billy. She would have him drop her off a block away and walk home and say she was with a friend. Billy had a dark side to him. He was against government laws and didn't want to vote or pay taxes. He would rant about making a militia and living in the mountains in Las Vegas. Many would describe it as a scary side of Billy, not just dark. Billy made sure that Amy knew how to take care of herself, teaching her how to shoot a gun, how to hunt, and how to fish. A year later, in 2001, Amy was about to be 17 and found out she was pregnant. Her and Billy ran off together at this point, and in 2002, they welcomed their son, Blade. Billy was such a proud father of his boy. He took him hunting, fishing, camping, and four-wheeling. Amy and Billy were very happy and loved showing off Blade. As Blade grew older, Amy decided that she wanted to do something for herself to be more independent so she applied to nursing school and was accepted. She would be more independent and be able to bring in a good income to the family. Nursing school took a lot of Amy's time and Billy started to not like that. As soon as Billy felt like he was losing control of Amy, the dark, scary, jealous side of Billy was awoken. As Amy began gaining things in her life, Billy was threatened by it and it messed with his ego. He would follow her to class because he didn't believe that she was actually going to class. He was extremely paranoid and would go through her purse and her cell phone and even begin going through her school laptop. Billy didn't want anyone outside of his family influencing Amy, so if she would make friends, he would call them and end their friendship. She really had no time for friends or to go out on him. She hardly had time for herself. Amy would always assure Billy that she would never do anything to hurt him, that she loved him, and that she was just trying to do what's best for the family. He never believed her and continued to follow her, in fear that she would take Blade and leave. The abuse Amy went through was devastating. He first began controlling her and isolating her, then moved on to emotional abuse. She didn't want to break her family up, though. In traditional Arkansas families, you work through anything. And this usually includes adultery, emotional, and physical abuse. Many women in Southern relationships value family and the idea of a relationship over their own safety. Eventually, Billy made Amy quit school. Everything that she built up, everything that made her proud of herself was being taken away from her. She felt that her whole life was falling apart, everything she worked so hard for and wanted. This was the point when Amy told Billy that they needed a break. The two were together for 10 years and had only been apart from each other for a few days. It wasn't a situation where they just enjoyed being together all the time. Billy didn't trust her being away from him. Billy was afraid that anyone that she was around would influence her. 
This caused a huge fight with her sister, and her and Nikki began not speaking. She explained to him that she wasn't leaving him. She just really needed a break. The whole time she was talking to him, explaining that she needed space, he wasn't responding to her. He just had a blank look on his face. Amy was afraid at this point. She had never seen Billy like this. This was the point when he lost it. He began kicking Amy with his still-toed boots, and all that she could do was scream and yell and tell him that she wouldn't tell anyone what happened, telling him what he wanted to hear, trying to stop the abuse. Amy felt like the beating went on forever. He would get so exhausted that he would stop for a short time just to rest on the couch. She described it like he was running a marathon. He didn't speak a word to her, and she described his eyes as if there was no life left in him. He kicked her in the stomach so many times that she couldn't breathe. She was in complete shock that someone she loved for so long would do this to her. Billy left and went into the other room and came back with an office chair. He sat Amy in the chair and took two belts and tied her arms down. Billy left the room for a while and Amy had no idea what he was doing. After a few minutes, he came back into the living room where she was tied down, carrying a huge pot. The closer he got, Amy could see steam coming from the pot and knew that he had boiling water. He sat the pot at her feet and forced her foot into the water. Amy screamed because the pain was unbearable. She described smelling burning flesh. Blade, at this point, heard the scream and came into the living room where Billy screamed at him and told him to go back into his room and to not come back out. Amy was in so much pain physically and mentally. Not only was the man that she loved for so long slowly killing her, but he just allowed their son to listen and witness the abuse. She started to fight back and kick the pot over. This only pissed Billy off more, and he kicked her in the nose, breaking it. He then left the room again, leaving Amy in fear that he was refilling the pot with more boiling water. When he re-entered the living room holding another pot of water just like Amy feared, she started pleading for him to stop when he walked over and dumped it over her head. At this point, he finally started speaking, going on about how she's not doing this to him. No one leaves him, and he won't let her take his kid from him. He looked her in the eyes and said, You're not leaving with my kid. I won't ever allow you to leave. Do you understand? Billy was taking every extreme measure he could to show Amy that he was the man and he was the boss. Nobody tells him what to do or leaves him. Amy was in fear that Billy would take his anger out on Blade next. At this point, the domestic abuse has moved on to torture. Amy had no idea what to expect. She did not know if he was going to torture her to death or if he was going to just eventually kill her. She still stayed as strong as she possibly could for Blade. She knew she couldn't leave Blade to live with his dad. Billy then grabbed a handful of ink pens and broke them open. Amy had no idea what he was about to do. Next, Billy gave Amy a homemade tattoo on her hand, dot by dot, until he finished tattooing a swastika on her hand, knowing that Amy would hate that. Amy was not only in pain, but she did not want this ugly tattoo on her hand. She was fighting Billy when he told her, Stop fighting or I'll tattoo your forehead. She then thought to herself, At this point, he's crazy. He'll actually do it. She was sure that the man she thought she knew and loved for over 10 years was completely insane. Billy told Amy that she was his and that no other man will ever want her now. It is common for some abusers to mark their victims. When he finished, he looked at her and told her, you're marked for life now, you're mine. Billy then went into Blade's room while his mother was tied up and tortured in the living room. Amy didn't know if Billy was going into Blade's room to hurt him or what he was doing. Billy told Blade to go into the bedroom, which means he had to walk through the living room and see his mother tied up, burned, and tortured. Amy says that she will never forget the look that Blade had on his face as he walked through and looked at his mother. To this day, it still breaks her heart. 
Billy was so afraid that everyone was against him and that they would talk Amy into leaving for good. The attack on Amy was deliberate and calculated. He felt like he was losing control of his wife and needed to regain it. After Blade went into the room, he untied Amy from the chair and drug her into their son's room. Amy was begging for him to let her go. She was sure he was going to kill her. She assured him that she would never call the cops or tell anyone about this. Billy told Amy that it was till death do us part, and the only way that she was ever leaving him was in a body bag. Billy thought, if he hurt her enough, she'll know he's serious. So he continued to torture her, beating her, choking her until she blacked out. Then he'd bring her back and do it again and again. He would bring lighters into the room and hold the flame to her skin, burning her. The torture continued all night, and after nine hours of continued abuse, Billy went on with their normal routine. He took Blade to school, and then he went to work. While home alone, she attempted to loosen the ropes to break free. She was so weak from not eating or drinking and being tortured all night. She had no strength left to even loosen these ropes. On day two, Amy realized that this was not just a burst of anger. Billy has had plenty of time to think about what he's done to her, but nothing changed. He was only thinking of more ways to hurt her. At this point, he drug her into the shower and allowed her to clean off a little. She said she had dried blood in her hair and all over her body. The sores began scabbing over. Her eye socket was black and she couldn't open her eye. Her whole abdomen was black and blue. Billy told her, I've hurt you this bad, why don't I just kill you? He entered the bathroom with a rope and tied one end to the shower head, the other end around her neck, and hanged her until she blacked out. This excited Billy. So he undid the rope and threw her back on Blade's bed in his room. This is where he tied her up again and told her that sex will make her feel better. And then he began to rape her. She had absolutely no strength left in her at this point that she couldn't even fight back. Billy told Amy that she was never good enough for him, and she was an awful person. He continued the mental abuse, just breaking her down. Billy never treated her this way before. She was in complete shock. Billy continued to come up with ways to torture her, and in his eyes, this degraded her. He would drag her into the garage and make her sleep in there on the concrete floor, coming in often to beat her. She tried to do everything to break free. She attempted to open the garage, but Billy even rigged this so no one could open it from the inside. On the fifth day of the torture, Amy began to give up. She was weak, hungry, thirsty, and in the worst pain of her life. She didn't see how she'd ever be freed from this horror. She was giving into the idea that this was it. All of a sudden, she hears the doorbell ring and thinks, it's either I'll be saved or he'll kill me. So she began screaming. She screamed, help me, I'm being tortured, as loud as she could. She hears another man's voice speaking to Billy, but then she doesn't hear them anymore. Billy stepped outside and shut the door to speak with the man. After Amy tried to get this visitor's attention, Billy knew that he had to punish her. He took her into the room where Blade was sleeping, held a shotgun to his head, and said, If you try anything else, I'll kill him, and then I'll kill you. It was clear to Amy that Billy thought this whole situation out. No matter what, he was taking complete control over her. On day six, Billy tells her that if she agrees to leave Blade with him and take off, he'll let her go. She agreed with him. She didn't plan on it, but she wanted to be saved. He then unties her and starts putting aloe vera all over her body and wrapping her wounds. Billy called her work and told them that she was moving out of state. He sold her car and signed her name on the bill of sale. He smashed her laptop and all their cell phones, cut the phone lines in the home, and burned every single item of hers that was in the house. 
On day seven, when he still didn't let her go, she realized that he was going to kill her and make it look like she left. She realized that no one was going to come look for her because her and her sister hadn't spoken in six months. Billy made sure that she didn't have any friends, and he already called her work. She noticed that he was slacking a little, though, when he tied her up. So when Blade and Billy left for the day, she would work on loosening up her restraint. She told herself that this is it. I either break free or this is how my life ends. Amy knew she had to break free for Blade. He was her strength and anchor, her reason to better herself. She finally wiggled her hands free and attempted to stand up, but due to how weak she was, she fell right over. She then drug herself slowly from the bedroom to the kitchen. She said she didn't even know how long it took, but it felt like forever. She made it into the kitchen and saw a broom and mop and drug herself over to those items. She used both of them as crutches and wobbled to the back door. Amy's heart stopped when she realized that Billy had placed locks on the inside of the door. How would she ever escape? She was in so much fear that he would arrive home and find her trying to escape, but she got this far. She wasn't giving up. She then began banging on a window until the glass broke and gave her a way to break free. She exited the home and struggled to get across the backyard and side yard into the street. She said cars would drive by and stare, but no one stopped to help her. She made it to a neighbor's home where she banged on the door until they opened. The neighbor did not even recognize Amy. They called the authorities and told them a woman arrived at their home beaten with skin burned off her body. The police arrived and Amy told them that they needed to immediately go get Blade from school. She was so afraid that he would come home and find out and then go kidnap Blade. One of the policemen went straight to the school and picked him up. Not long after, Billy arrived home and he denied everything. He told the police that Amy did this to herself, that they were self-inflicted wounds. Amy suffered from broken ribs, a collapsed lung, a broken eye socket, Third-degree burns all over her body, bruises, and abrasions. There isn't anyone who would self-inflict those kind of injuries on themselves. William Dunlap, Billy, was arrested for kidnapping, domestic battery in the first degree, terroristic threatening, and aggravated assault. A no-contact order was immediately issued and his bail was set to $200,000. He did make bail, but under the conditions that he has no indirect or direct communication with Amy or Blade. This no contact order was explicitly explained to Billy due to the fact that he threatened to kill Amy and Blade if she ever went to the police. Immediately after his release, his father began calling Amy's parents, demanding his truck. On Mother's Day that year, Billy decided to ride his bike in front of Amy's mother's home back and forth for hours. They immediately revoked his bond and a bench warrant was issued. On May 18, 2011, Billy was committed into the Arkansas State Hospital on suicide watch. He was released when the physician said that he wasn't a harm to himself. His lawyers attempted to get his bail reinstated, but the judge refused. Billy ended up taking a negotiated plea deal and was sentenced to 72 years in prison. His lawyers motioned to get his sentence reduced because 72 years is basically life. I don't think many people will disagree with me that this man should remain in prison for the rest of his life. To this day, Amy still suffers from PTSD, but is much happier. She had to learn to walk again and continue therapy. She cherishes every second she has with Blade and her family. While researching the case, I did find that not long before this incident, they did apply for a marriage certificate, but it was never returned, which cancels the certificate. So the two were not legally married, which does make it easier for Amy not having to go through a divorce. Three years later, Billy requested post-conviction relief under Rule 31. The judge denied the request because that must be filed within 90 days, not three years. In 
Amy did remarry and is so in love with Clyde. Thanks to all for listening to another episode of Strictly Homicide Podcast. Please stay tuned to listen to promos from some killer podcasts. No pun intended, seriously. Mom's the Murder, Trace Evidence, and a promo you don't want to miss from Suspect Conviction. Strictly Homicide is written and hosted by me, Nikki T. The original music and production is done by Mr. T. No, not that one. My Mr. T. If you have enjoyed the show, please remember to tell a friend and rate us and review us on iTunes. You can also help support the show on Patreon. Just search for Strictly Homicide Podcast. If there is a case that you would like us to discuss, or if you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, send us an email at strictlyhomicide at yahoo.com or contact us on social media. Visit our webpage at strictlyhomicide.com where you can find links to all our social media, Patreon page, merchandise, and a button for one-time donations. For news on the podcast and pictures from the episode I cover, you can find our Facebook page, discussion group, and Instagram by searching for Strictly Homicide Podcast and on Twitter at Strictly H-M-I-C-I-D-E. Stick around to hear a few promos, and until the next time, y'all stay safe, especially you, Arkansas. Hey guys, it's Melissa and Mandy with the Moms and Murder podcast. We're a true crime podcast that's sure to make you laugh without compromising the seriousness of the content. Mm. Despite our name, we aren't just for the moms. Our show is for all the Diet Coke drinking, chicken loving, dateline watching people in your life. Come for the murder and stay for the witty humor and pop culture references. And you never know, you may even hear from some of your favorite names in the world of true crime. Like Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz. Do you have a preference on what we call you, Josh Mankiewicz, Manx, Sir Manx a lot? Uh, I don't hear Sir, Sir Manx a lot quite as often as I. <laughs> I can make it happen for you. Like I will to, make it happen. But... Broken Homicide's Derek Lavasser. Are you tearing up on me? I saw you waiting. <laughs> so beautiful, everything you're saying. <laughs> or even America's sweetheart, Ali Sweeney. The neighbor suggested that perhaps Kathleen had been attacked by an owl. The owl theory um, that Melissa and Ali Sweeney Stop believe. Like Again, that. so <laughs> judgy. Check out Moms and Murder anywhere podcasts are found. Hey, podcast listener. This is Stephen, the host of Trace Evidence, a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and missing persons. Each week, I dig deep into the evidence, suspects, and theories revolving around the unsolved cases you think you know, Elisa Lamb, Asia Degree, Brandon Lawson, and the ones you've never heard, Lily Aramburo, Candace Hilt, Kanika Powell. If you're a true crime fan haunted by unanswered questions, Join me each Monday for a thorough examination of the victims, their stories, and the unknown perpetrators behind them. Trace Evidence is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and all your favorite podcatchers. Visit trace-evidence.com for a full list of episodes, transcripts, and to subscribe today. In 1990, newspaper reporter Scott Reeder found a nine-year-old girl's body abandoned in an Iowa school playground. I got to the school right when it was starting to get dark, and there was a police officer there, and the two of us walked over to where we could see a fire on the edge of the playground. We got about a foot from the flames and looked down and realized it was the body of a little girl that had been doused with gasoline and set on fire. The case has haunted him for 27 years. Did the police arrest and a jury convict the wrong person? In 2017, Scott Reeder and the national public radio affiliate WVIK launched the podcast Suspect Convictions to explore that question. Suspect Convictions soared to number two in the world on iTunes overall chart and captured a top honor for investigative reporting from the Associated Press. 
The defendant, Stanley Liggins, who has been granted a new trial, will go to court beginning August 28th. And suspect convictions will cover every day of the trial and provide you with the testimony jurors will hear, as well as some information they won't. I ran a second test on a different type of test. It's called a peak of tension test. I listed seven different causes of death. Well, he nailed strangulation. He reacted to the strangulation because he knew that's how she died. So then I went over and told him, that's the guy. Well, then I was a hero. Suspect Convictions is a podcast unlike any other. It asks the tough questions others fear to raise. They talk to witnesses. I was brought out of my cell and told I needed to testify or else I'd be charged with accessory after the fact. They talk to past jurors. I've grown up with black people all my life, you know, in Africa, and most of them, you know, they, they can be, um, I won't say threatening, but, but they do appear sometimes to be aggressive looking or, you know, uh, I don't want to sound like a racist or anything like that. They talk to lawyers. Don't be misled by dramatizations about circumstantial evidence. Evidence is evidence, and the jury is permitted and directed to give the weight that the evidence deserves. And they look at irregularities in the case. In one of the later post-conviction relief cases, it was determined that there were about 70 police reports that weren't turned over from the police department to the county attorney's office that had some exculpatory evidence. Suspect Convictions complies with the high reporting standards of National Public Radio. It will post daily episodes throughout the trial, as well as commentary and information that will never be heard in the courtroom. To subscribe, look for Suspect Convictions on whatever podcasting platform you use.